fellow believers, friends, scholars, colleagues, and other Bible executives. This is Alvin Bernard bringing to you a very significant and important topic concerning passage of scripture found in Daniel chapter 8. I'm entitling this The Vision. I want to share some very pertinent information concerning the vision of 2300 era Oka, better known as 2300 evenings and mornings. It has to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I want to take time to share this because it's a very significant topic that we all should know something about. The sanctuary cleansing. 2300 evenings and mornings. What is the truth concerning the time for the cleansing of the sanctuary? When? How? By whom? These are questions that everyone would like to get an answer to. So let's look at the passage of scripture in Daniel chapter 8 verses 13 and 14. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision, and I want to place special emphasis on the vision, concerning the daily sacrifice, the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under foot. Notice the three points in this question. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, number one, the transgression of desolation, number two, and to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot, number three. And he said unto me, this is the answer to the question with three parts, unto 2,300 days, actually evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What vision are we talking about? It concerns the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. With what outcome? The answer is to give the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So let's recap that again. The vision concerns 2300 evenings and mornings. The vision is about the cleansing of the sanctuary. The vision concerns the daily sacrifice and also desolation. The vision concerns the city and the sanctuary being trodden underfoot, or we may even say trampled underfoot. Is this vision true? Daniel chapter 8 verses 26 and 27 says, And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Do we want it any plainer than that? The vision is true because the interpreting angel said, The vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. But what is the truth about this vision? In order for us to understand a little more about the cleansing of the sanctuary, we must go back in time to the days of Moses. From the days of Moses, the people of Yahweh were very familiar with the cleansing of the sanctuary. On a daily basis, sacrificial blood was sprinkled on the veil of the sanctuary, and once a year, once a year, the high priest administered a cleansing work. So on that day of atonement, the sanctuary was cleansed. Uh, let's read Leviticus 16, verse 29. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and 
do no work at all. Whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. And verse 30 says, For on that day the priest, the high priest, shall make atonement for you to cleanse you. And it continues that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Friends, it's very significant that we understand what actually took place on the day of atonement. Verse 33 says, He shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest, and for all the people of the congregation. This was a very significant day in the lives of the people of Israel. On the Day of Atonement, the sanctuary was definitely cleansed. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. Let's go back to verse 16 of that chapter in Leviticus 16. It says, He shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. So shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So we discovered that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into the holiest to make an atonement to cleanse the sanctuary of the sins that had technically accumulated in the holy place over the 11 months of the year. And on the, the 12th month, actually, it was the 7th month of the Jewish calendar, but it was the twelfth month since it was cleansed. On that twelfth month of the year, as it were, the, the sanctuary was cleansed. Now, let's look a little further as to what the 2300 evening and morning uh, uh, relates, how that relates to the cleansing of the sanctuary. Because the vision was for many days, it is evident then that the vision was not about the annual day of atonement. Neither could it be referring to a cleansing after a defilement by a character like Antiochus Epiphanes, who, uh, as we know, offered a pig on the altar because the temple needed to be cleansed of the sins of the people even without his defilement with a pig. Uh, so th this, this, this sanctuary cleansing that Daniel was told about uh, was significant in that it was not referring to the annual cleansing of the sanctuary by the high priest. Another significant point is the Ark of the Covenant uh, was always in the most holy place of the sanctuary. From Moses' tabernacle to Solomon's temple, the ark in the most holy place was used in the shadowy cleansing of the sanctuary and the people. You read that in Leviticus 16, 11 through 16. However, after the destruction of Solomon's temple in 587 B.C., I want you to pay special attention to that fact. After the destruction of Solomon's temple in 587 BC by Nebuchadnezzar, the ark was hidden by Jeremiah and was never used again in the shadowy cleansing. Jeremiah had prophesied in Jeremiah 3.16, and this is what it says, 
and it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. Jeremiah 3, 16. No ark after 587 B.C. So most of the time that the children of Israel were in Babylon, from 606 to 536 B.C., there was no ark of the covenant used in the cleansing of the sanctuary. So when Daniel was praying and it was mentioned that after 2300 evenings and mornings the sanctuary would be cleansed, there was still concern as to how the sanctuary would be cleansed if the Ark of the Covenant was not in the Holy of Holies. So after the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar, the children of Israel and Judah had no way of really fully completing the cleansing of the sanctuary. Even the symbolic or shadowy cleansing was not done. Even when the temple was rebuilt after the exile, there was no Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. No Ark, no cleansing, because the Ark of the Covenant was always used on an annual basis for the cleansing of the sanctuary. Then how could the sanctuary be cleansed? After the captivity, the high priest function in the most holy place was equivalent to a cross. There was no ark and mercy seat to sprinkle the blood of the atonement animals. Although the blood of the innocent sacrifices uh, was sprinkled on the veil, there was no annual cleansing, only an empty ritual. Read further in Leviticus 16 on this matter. So the sanctuary needed cleansing. Even when enemies of God's people polluted the temple, the shadowy performances did not remove the pollution or the sin. In prophetic insight, God told Daniel that the real cleansing would take place as a future event after many days. A much bigger atonement was being prophesied about here. This cleansing of the sanctuary had to do with an event that was so significant that God had to involve his most trusted prophet and a few angels to deliver the message. This was to be the big one. An atonement that was more important than all previous atonements put together. Heaven must have been really exciting. Just imagine, since the days of Adam, God had promised to do something about sin. He knew that the lamb slain had to be a real sacrifice and not a sacrificial sheep or some bovine blood. It involved his only begotten son. And time was approaching for the real sacrifice. The vision was given to announce the time. It was at the end of 2300. The vision was pointing to an event that superseded the sacrifice of animals. It was pointing to an event in which the Messiah himself was involved. How long shall be the vision? And he said unto me, Up to two thousand and three hundred days, actually evenings and mornings again, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Twenty-three hundred evenings and mornings, uh, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So regardless of when we think this time is, let's just uh, draw a graph representing 2300 evenings and mornings at the end of which 
the cleansing of the sanctuary would take place. Then in Daniel chapter 9, we are moving from Daniel 8 to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. The 77th prophecy was given to explain this vision. Now what was the connection between the two? What was the connection between the 77s and the 2300 E&M vision of sanctuary cleansing? 70 times 7 were determined upon the people and the city. And let's look at the things that were scheduled uh, for the people during this time to finish transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision. Yes, I did say, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Go to Daniel 9 and read that again. Most of us probably never even noticed that what was necessary during the 20, uh, during the 70 times 7 period, included the sealing up of the vision and prophecy and the anointing of the most holy. So Daniel uh, was assisted by the angel. The angel helps Daniel to understand the vision. And he says in chapter 10, verse 14, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Notice also that uh, Daniel was told that the angel was going to help him to understand what shall befall, and notice, thy people. Who were Daniel's people? Daniel's people referred to some of the descendants of the very ones who had been in captivity. It's referring to the Jews, the people of Judah, the people of Israel. They were considered to be thy people. And it was going to tell them what would happen to them in the latter days, for it concerns the vision which was yet for many days. So we want to know what Daniel's people were going to experience at the end of 77s or at the end of the vision which we know was ending after 2300 evenings and mornings. Uh, let's review them again. To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. By now I hope you're beginning to see that there is a definite relationship. These two visions are inextricably linked to each other. They cannot be separated. During the 77s then, the Messiah, the Anointed One, was going to appear. Also, the vision must be sealed up. That is, the sanctuary must be cleansed, making a way for the city and the sanctuary to be destroyed by the prince that shall come. Interesting. Read it in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26 again. But let's look at the definition of seal up. What does it mean? to seal up something. The Hebrew word the Hebrew word is found in Strong's Concordance number 2856 Chatham which means to close up especially to seal or to make an end to mark to seal up or to stop. So According to the prophecy of the 77s, the vision of 2300 must be sealed up, that is, 
to close up, especially to seal, to make an end, to mark, to stop before 77s come to an end and the city and the sanctuary be destroyed. I want us to look again closely at that. According to the prophecy of the 77s, the vision of the 2300 evenings and mornings must be sealed up. That is, to close up, especially to seal or to make an end, to stop before 77s came to an end and the city and the sanctuary destroyed. I think so many individuals have overlooked that simple factor in trying to find an understanding for the 2300 evenings and mornings. So, with what outcome was this uh, uh, sanctuary cleansing, what outcome was it to bring? It says, to give the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. The vision concerns 2300. The vision is about the cleansing of the sanctuary. The vision concerns the daily sacrifice and transgression of desolation. The vision concerns the city and the sanctuary be trampled. So, uh, looking at it more graphically in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, it says 77 are 70 perfect sabbatical cycles from 457 BC to 3480. Sabbatical cycle is a period of seven years. Seventy sevens are seventy sabbatical cycle, each cycle being seven years, giving us a total of four hundred and ninety years. But before we look at those four hundred and ninety years, it's important that we understand that the vision of twenty three hundred must stop before the seventy seven came to an end in 3480. Notice the time to the Messiah. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, that is sixty-nine weeks or if we want to understand it more as 69 sevens, each seven being a sabbatical cycle of seven years. Uh, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem then was issued in the year 457 B.C. So the Messiah appears after 69 sevens. Don't be mistaken, man. The Messiah does not die at the end of 69 weeks or 69 sevens or 483 years, but he dies in the middle of the 70th seven, which uh, actually comes after 487.5 years. From the word Korath in verse 26, it is understood that he covenants after the 69th week, and he confirms that covenant for one week or for seven years, and that is the 70th, the 70th week. He will confirm the covenant for one week. The Messiah, the Messiah confirms the covenant. The work of the Messiah after the 69th week or during the 70th week is explained by the angel in Daniel 9, 27, and also Daniel 12, 1 through 13. Uh, we will uh, look at that complete graph on this covenant week that is shown. And this is the 70th week of Daniel. Notice where it begins. It begins in 2780 and ends. 3480. 3180 was the middle of the 70th seven. 
And that week, we can call it the covenant week, because that week is what the Bible says. He will confirm the covenant for many with one week, and then in the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblations to cease. Now, there are many more things about this covenant week that we need to discuss, but we will return to it uh, shortly. So, here is another point. The 77s were also determined to anoint the Most Holy. The results of the 77s include making reconciliation for iniquity, ending the 2300 evenings and mornings by cleansing the sanctuary, and also anointing the Most Holy. Now, on the Day of Atonement, animal sacrifices had to be offered as long as the way into the holiest was not made possible. The sanctuary services were necessary for such purpose. However, an, an entrance was made by the high priest on the Day of Atonement when the sanctuary was cleansed. Notice how this could be demonstrated. Psalm 77 and verse 13 says, Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. And let's look at some things that might have been overlooked over the years as we studied about the sanctuary. Notice from Second Chronicles chapter 3 verses 3 through 10 with emphasis on verses 3 and also 8 that God told Moses to build the sanctuary according to this pattern that was shown to him while in the mount Hebrews 8 and verse 5 tells us that and the sanctuary dimensions were as indicated in this graph 60 cubits was divided into two rooms 40 cubits and 20 cubits. Notice carefully, the 60 cubit length of the sanctuary was divided into two separate rooms. One was 40 cubits and the other was 20 cubits. And then a veil separated the holy from the most holy. Therefore, the room that was uh, referred to as a sanctuary was uh, 40 cubits in length, and then the holiest, or the most holy place, was 20 cubits. Notice also, the Holy Ghost is signifying that a way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle, which was the old system, was yet standing. Hebrews 9 and verse 8, we read that. So animal sacrifices could not remove sins, and uh, so no one was allowed into the holiest. That is what Hebrews was saying. So. Uh, the work of the high priest on the Day of Atonement was indicative of the fact that a way into the holiest had not yet been made possible while the old system of animal sacrifices was still in operation. But something happened when Christ died on the cross. Because animal sacrifices could not really cleanse the Christ went into the sanctuary to cleanse it with his own blood. After 4,000 years of animal sacrifices, notice again in the graph that 40 cubits represented 4,000 years of animal sacrifices. From Adam's sin then to Christ's death on the cross was exactly 4,000 years, and that was represented in the building model by 40 cubits. Notice one cubit, 
was one century. But after Christ's atonement, he went into the holiest of all, and that portion was 20 cubits in length, representing a period of time uh, 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 also indicated by one cubit equals the one century. So follow me closely. First uh, John 1 and verse 7 says that the blood of his son cleanses us from all sin. So the effect of the cleansing of the sanctuary in 3180, the ceremonial services with animal sacrifices came to an end in Daniel 8, 11 through 13 and 9, 27. Then the sanctuary that serves such purposes could then be destroyed. Daniel 8, 11, 13, 24 and 9, 26. A way into the holiest was made possible. And we can read that in Hebrews 9 and verse 8. Hebrews 10, 19 through 21, where it says we can now go boldly into the holiest by a new and living way that he had consecrated for us through the veil, which is to say his flesh. And then in Matthew 27 and verse 51, we discover that when Christ died on the cross, the veil in the temple, that same veil that separated the holy from the most holy was rent from top to bottom, indicating that there was no longer a uh, hindrance or it was not prohibited anymore to enter into the holiest because through the shed blood of Christ, a way had been made for us to enter into the very presence of our Father, as he did. The transgressors under the First Testament were canceled. Yes, Hebrews 9 reminds us of that. And those who were called received the promise of eternal inheritance. Do you remember that when Christ died, many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the grave after his resurrection? And they could not have gotten out of their graves if they had not received the promise of eternal inheritance. And they could not receive the promise of eternal inheritance if they had not been cleansed of their sins. So the defiled sanctuary on earth was cleansed of sin. Christ entered once into the sanctuary to cleanse it with his own blood. An entrance into the holiest was made possible after old system was obviated and cleansed. Christ's atonement on earth made it possible for us to enter boldly into the holiest by a new and living way he had consecrated for us at Hebrews 10, 18 through 22. Reminds us of that. So here we see graphically again that from the very first lamb that was slain when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden of Eden God killed a lamb and used the skin of that animal to clothe them to remove the fig leaf covering that they had put upon themselves God used the covering of a lamb to shield their nakedness and since that time, the, the life of a slain animal and the blood that was shed was used to cover mankind's sin. And so from Adam's first sin and the killing of the first lamb to the coming of the Messiah on the cross, was exactly 4,000 years. And he died to cleanse all sins from Adam's sin to his second coming. So friends, the end of ceremonial uh, animal sacrifices occurred in 
3180 when Christ died on the cross. And so he went from the holy, symbolically went from the holy to the most holy. It is noteworthy that the holy place in the earthly shadowy sanctuary type was merely to demonstrate that the way to the most holy was not yet made possible because the true sacrifice had not been offered. And so Christ died once. His atonement in 3180 was so complete and permanent it was not necessary to ever have it repeated. There is no other date or time after that event that could literally or symbolically duplicate, add to, substitute, remove, or overshadow what was done by Christ when he sacrificed himself for us. I hope I do not have to repeat that, but there is no other date or time after that event that could literally, symbolically duplicate, add to, substitute, remove, or overshadow what was done by Christ when he sacrificed himself for us. Christ's atonement not only cleansed the sins of the temple backwards to 587 BCE when there was no ark in the holy place, or the most holy place, but also the sins all the way back to Adam. And then, uh, not just all the way back to Adam, 4,000 years before his death, but he covered the future to his second coming of as well, which was represented by the 20 minutes for 2,000 years in the future. To suggest that after his ascension to his father, he was assigned duties in a holy apartment in heaven with future anticipation of going into the holiest at a later date is, number one, to accept that his perfect sacrifice was tantamount to the blood of bulls and goats, which pointed to a future event of atonement and the sanctuary cleansing, and another more perfect sacrifice was somehow necessary. We can see how preposterous that idea is. And also, if we do not accept his atonement in 3180, then number two is that heaven where God dwells is compartmentalized with holy and not so holy units. And Christ had to wait a long time before going to his father. Some even believe that his father left the most holy place and came into a holy place to meet him there. I want to say, folks, that wherever the father is, it's holy. There is no other place that could be holier than where the father is. So if he leaves the most holy, as some would think, and go into the holy, then that holy becomes the most holy. It's as if the President of the United States were to step on a commercial airline during one of his travels. That commercial airline becomes Air Force One, whether it's Delta, American, Continental, Spirit, Air Tran. If the President of the United States, while he's in office, steps on any one of these carriers, it automatically becomes Air Force One. So similarly, if God the Father leaves the most holy and goes into the holy place, that holy place immediately becomes the most holy place. It's as simple as that. And so we cannot compartmentalize heaven. There's only one atonement that is necessary. The fact is, he did not return to heaven to continue the first apartment activities in a holy place apart and, or apart from the holiest because the holiest was in the presence of the Father. And to him, he did ascend. Here's what Hebrews 9 says. 
but Christ being come an high priest. An high priest. Remember, the high priest function was on the day of atonement. The high priest function on the day of atonement, or the, or the high priest function in the cleansing of the sanctuary. Therefore, when it says that Christ being come a high priest, he is, has done, or continues to do atonement work and high priest. By his own blood as well, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear. Where? In the presence of God. The very presence of God for us. Here are some passages of scripture that tell us beyond the shadow of a doubt where Christ went when he ascended to his Father. In John 14, 12, he says, Because I go unto my Father. John 14, 28 says, Because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. John 16, verse 19, uh, it says of righteousness because I go to my Father. How many times he had to say, I go to my Father before those who were listening and those who read about him understand that when he left earth, he went directly to his Father. And wherever his Father is, that's the Holy of Holies. He said to uh, he said also in John 20 and 17, But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and to your Father, and to my God, and your God. Hebrews 10 and verse 12 adds, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of Almighty God. Another significant point is that when he ascended to heaven, he ascended to heaven for his inauguration. All heaven was waiting to receive the Messiah when he returned to heaven. And this is how Daniel saw his return to heaven in vision. I saw in the night vision and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him there before him. He came to the Ancient of Days, the Ancient of Days being the Father himself. And they brought him there before him. For what purpose? And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Now let's return to the vision again. The vision concerns 2300 evenings and morning. The vision uh, was to give the sanctuary and the host to be trodden on the foot. And so the vision is about the cleansing of the sanctuary. The vision concerns the daily sacrifice of desolation. And the vision concerns the city and the sanctuary being trampled on the foot. Now, the sanctuary had to be cleansed before it was given over to be trampled on the foot. I dare say that most Bible scholars, even some of my dear friends, have overlooked this simple fact that when the question was asked about the sanctuary and 2300 evenings and mornings uh, was mentioned, the fact is that the sanctuary had to be cleansed before it was given over to be trampled on the foot. 
Now since their sanctuary had to be cleansed before it was destroyed, and since 2300 must stop or be finished before the 77th ended, we must now determine the meaning of the expression evening, morning, or Ereboka in the original. The term Ereboka was a Babylonian expression for time, past, as well as future. Evening, morning, in the same sense as we use B.C. and A.D. nowadays. Babylon, which originally Babel, was founded by Nimrod in 2270 B.C. Sometime shortly after the flood, the flood was in 2348 B.C. and then Shem, Ham, and Japheth came out of the ark and one of Ham's descendants was Nimrod. And Nimrod founded the city of Babel, which was the most ancient uh, city of Babylon. And Daniel received the vision in 553 BC. Now, you don't have to take my word for it, but check the historical records. In 553 BC, Daniel received the vision of 2300 evenings, mornings. And he was in Babylon when he received that vision. Now, what calendar do you think he would have been using? while he was in Babylon. Remember, the AD BC calendar was not yet developed or invented. And there had to be some way of counting time, even while the children of Israel were in exile in Babylon. So 553 BC was the same as 1718 Babylonian, counting from 2270 BC when Babylon was founded. Uh, so when Daniel received the vision in 553 BC, it was the 1718th year of Babylon. He was actually being told that the cleansing of the sanctuary was scheduled for many days or 582 years future. Look carefully at the graph. In the 1718th year of Babylon, Daniel received a vision that in 2300 the sanctuary would be cleansed. And so friends, when, when Christ died on the cross and he said, it is finished. What was finished? The old sanctuary system had come to an end. Number two, the time allotted for the cleansing of the sanctuary had also been finished. The cry from the cross, it is finished, meant that the atonement had been complete and complete. He could then ascend to the Father. The place of the earthly sanctuary could be cast down, which is to say that Jerusalem could then be destroyed. And so we know that Christ ascended to heaven, he went directly to his Father, and he continues to minister on behalf of us in the heavenly holy of holies, and he began doing that since 3180. Because he was made king and high priest in heaven, all attention has been shifted from the holy place on earth, Jerusalem on earth, to the holiest in heaven, Jerusalem in heaven. No longer were symbolic ceremonial sacrifices necessary. His atonement and cleansing took care of all such symbols. It was so complete that the old system and the place used for such purposes could then be permanently, permanently removed. Christ knew that the destruction of Jerusalem was pending, just as prophesied by Daniel, and he made the statement 
in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and you would not. In other words, you would not allow me to gather you as a head gathers her chicks on their wings. And so he said to the people of Jerusalem, Your house is left of you desolate. Matthew 23, 38. The city and the sanctuary could then be trampled, and when you shall see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. This is in Luke 21, verses 20 through 24, also Matthew 24, 15, and, and Daniel 9, 26. He was being told in these passages of Scripture that when you see the Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that the desolation thereof is nigh, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captives into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And here in this picture we see the Romans using their battlements, their war engines to scale the walls of Jerusalem. And who knows uh, uh, what a damaging, catastrophic result that was. Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus, the people of the prince in 70 AD, just as was prophesied. So here are some reasons for the cleansing in 31 AD. The preponderance of scriptural evidence confirms the fact that the atonement took place in 31 AD, as was prophesied. The cleansing, the prophesied cleansing of the sanctuary at the end of 2300 AD. Thereafter, a way was opened into the holies and here are ten irrefutable reasons why we should believe that what took place at the cross was the cleansing of the sanctuary. Here's the first reason. 